you had to answer the question right now, what is the Higgs boson? Okay. And you all have it. Yes. Uh, it's the particle that assigns mass to matter. It's the particle that assigns mass to matter. Okay, well, that is a huge responsibility. <laughs> uh, what else? Yes. It's like the, the particles that like, cause forces, but for gravity, but also kind of not. <laughs> because if it involves explaining why particles have mass at all, then that means, in a way, it's the one who decides if you participate gravitationally. Mm, the thing, though, is we learned something over the summer about what actually causes gravitational effects, and definitely mass does, but... Something else does. Uh, the curvature of space-time is, is what matter does to space, and that is what gravitation is, but there's one other thing that creates gravitational fields because if mass does, energy does. Energy has to. Remember, we learned that mass yes. is just a very dense, concentrated form of energy, rest energy, but all types of energy count. And it is crucially, crucially, crucially important to understanding what is the Higgs boson. And the reason why we got into that originally was, was this. We looked at the simplest thing you can possibly imagine, a <laughs> I wish I had the chalkboard. This is working just fine. Okay, right. This is the first time I've really done it this way, so when my hand's shaking and I'm thinking and I'm talking all at the same time, I'm at my limit. Uh, uh, so that's just a hydrogen atom. Um, but when we talked about this more carefully, one of the things that we learned was something a bit strange that if you took the mass of the proton and you took the mass of the electron and you compared that with the mass of the hydrogen, um, <laughs> okay, the mass of the hydrogen atom, you'd think that this should work out. But it doesn't work out. We learned that the hydrogen atom is lighter than the sum of the mass of its parts. And the reason why was that in here, there is an electric field, which is how the proton and the electron are actually attracting one another. And because the proton and the electron have opposite electric charge, that actually meant that the energy associated with their attraction is negative. It's a negative potential energy. And if you actually include that, the electric potential energy, but then it's an energy, so we have to divide it by c squared to turn it into a mass version, equivalent of it, and this being negative, that is how this ends up becoming an equation. But we can't forget that energy contribution. Okay. This is going to be really important for understanding the Higgs boson a little bit later. All right. So supposedly responsible for giving particles mass. All right. Well, what I want to know then is where the heck are they all? <laughs> because clearly everything that we are made of Okay, maybe with the exception of gluons and protons, but all the quarks that make up the protons and neutrons and the electrons that make up your body, those all have mass. So if the Higgs is contributing to that, then where the heck is it? And what, or where is it hiding? <laughs> maybe that notion that it's responsible for giving particles their masses is maybe a bit too quick. And it definitely is a little bit too quick. The deeper answer to it is way more fascinating, yeah. Okay, so this is really interesting because one of the things that we also learned was about the standard model of particle physics, which is basically a list of all of the fundamental constituents of the universe. Six quarks, the electron, the muon, and the tau, and the three associated neutrinos. Those are 12 total things. That's what makes up the matter side of things. But really, we learned that all particles including the ones responsible for interactions, the gluons that bounce around back and forth between the quarks that bind them up into protons and neutrons, the photons that move between any two charged objects. All of those are excitations of fields. The bigger picture was that we learned to think of the universe in a very different way, that the entire universe really should be thought of as a overlap of a large number of quantum fields and the particles that we think of the universe being made of are excitations of those fields. So what this also means, though, is that the Higgs boson, whatever it is, actually must just be the excitation of yet another field. But it's not like we have Higgs bosons in our bodies. You don't need to make up ordinary matter. 
So the most important thing about getting started with what is the Higgs boson, though, is to understand why would Peter Higgs, back in 1964, along with five or six other prominent physicists, why would they even think about the thing in the first place? What was the need? What was wrong with the understanding of the standard model that required this to be suggested? Um, why is it just called the Higgs boson? Because if you actually wrote all six of their, their names out, it's like that long, and his was the easiest that rolled off the tongue. So <laughs> it ended up being the Higgs boson, but he was just one of six. Um, three of them, the ones that are still with us, they earned the Nobel Prize for this work. That's something about the Nobel Prize, actually. You can't get a Nobel Prize for just thinking something up. You actually have to think it up, and then experimentally it has to be found. And only at that point can you actually get a Higgs, can you get an uh, Nobel Prize for it. So that means that actually the story of the Higgs boson is almost a 50-year endeavor. The prediction of it was in the 1960s, and it wasn't found until 2012 in the largest, most expensive experiment that humankind has ever produced, the Large Hadron Collider. And it even then took several years to find the hints of the Higgs boson. So we need to figure out why would you suggest that it exists? Why do we need it? And two, why would humankind have been willing to spend on the order of $10 billion to actually see if it's real? I mean, the stakes sound pretty high, though. It sounds like if you need the Higgs boson to explain why things have mass at all, well, then you need, to, you need the Higgs boson to explain why anything exists. Actually, it's even more hilarious. If nothing had mass, everything would be like a photon, and it would move at light speed all the time. That's not cool. <laughs> it might, it's cool to think about, but you wouldn't think about it if that was actually the way that the universe functioned. Okay, so why do we even need the Higgs boson at all? This is, well, this is a little bit hard. All right, we learned about the standard model. We learned that it has many, many different pieces to it. There's the up quark, the down quark, the strange quark, the charm quark, the top quark, the bottom quark, and then we learn that there is the electron, which we seriously need for atoms, the muon, which is kind of a heavy version of the electron, the tau, which is an even heavier version of the electron, and then a neutrino that goes with each of them. Okay. Now, every one of these, the neutrinos included now, are, well, nine of them definitely have mass, the first nine. The last three, uh, jury's still out. One of those might be massless, but two of them definitely are not. Bottom line is, everything in here has non-zero mass. Uh, there's some things that don't have mass, but they're not the things that ordinary objects are made from. And those are the photon. It's, matter's not made of those, but it is, the, it is needed for matter to interact, any two charged objects to interact. Then there are gluons times eight. Uh, the gluons, these are what hold the quarks together. Uh, they are essentially the mechanism behind this strong nuclear interaction. Uh, and then we noticed, we came across an interaction that was a bit on the weird side. Uh, it's called the weak interaction. I highly prefer calling it the weird interaction. <laughs> and its weirdness is also very important for understanding what is going on with the Higgs boson. Uh, there are three particles that get exchanged when the weak interaction is going on. Uh, the W plus, the W minus, the Z zero. We learned about these over the summer. These are the interaction particles. Uh, 12 on top, 12 on the bottom. That's not a coincidence, but that's not the topic for today. All right. Now, here's the thing about this. We learned that particles are excitations of fields. Now, in order for that idea to be very useful, we need to have a mathematical version of it so that when we actually build expensive detectors, we'll be able to tell the difference between what the standard model predicts and then what actually happens in the universe. And things get really interesting when the physics that you think you understand predicts one thing and then the universe shows you something else. That means we don't have the whole picture, and to be honest, we'll never have the whole picture because we'll never know, because some clever person, possibly one of you the next day, might find a novel way to test the standard model, which no one ever thought about, and you'll find a new hole. <laughs> that's why science is so fun, because we know it's never done. And kind of by definition, we can't know if it's ever done. So we keep working. Okay, now, in the mathematical formulation of the standard model, 
there's something very interesting that we find out when we look at how the electron is actually described mathematically. Now, just like over the summer, we're not gonna actually try to dig into the mathematics, but I'm going to try to do it in pictures. And so here goes. Let's imagine for a minute that this is an electron. And we know that the electron is not a point-like object. We learned that fundamentally all entities are wave-like. They are vibrational excitations of fields, so we shouldn't draw them as a dot. We can draw them sort of localized, but they don't really have a hard beginning and end. Instead, they have just a region where the field, in this case the electron field, is above quiet mode. Right? The vacuum, what we call vacuum, is the most quiet mode that the fields could be in. If there's an electron present, then that means the electron field has one quantum worth of extra energy in it, one additional vibration. Now, because the electron is wave-like, though, I really shouldn't end by drawing it like this. It's got to have some sort of wavy component to it, I suppose. If I wanted to draw that, I guess I'll just kind of do that, cartoon style. But see, the thing about the waviness of the electron is that that nature is kind of internal to it. See, these quantum fields are complex things. We talked about what fields were. The most common, the most common notion of a field is there's a gravitational field in this room, and at every point in space, it's a vector that points downwards with a value of 9.8. That's what we mean by a field. It's got a value at every location in space, and technically in time, because if we come back tomorrow, I suppose the gravitational field will still be more or less the same, and still there. Now, that kind of a field is what's called a vector field. Vectors have an x component, a y component, and a z component. You have to specify all three of those if you wanted to say what the gravitational field at a single point is. It's not like, though, that the gravitational field actually has like a physical length in meters. It's not like you can take a meter stick up to a region of space and measure the length of a gravitational field vector. It's just at that one point, and it just happens to require a directional quantity to say what it's doing, as opposed to the temperature in this room. Right there, that's just a number. It's not a vector. The thing is, with the quantum fields, they are even more sophisticated than that. They're not just vectors. They usually have a lot more structure to them. In the case of the electron, it is actually, at every point in space, it's two complex-valued quantities. In other words, quantity A with a real and imaginary component. Yeah, the electron field requires the square root of minus one <laughs> to actually describe it accurately. Uh, and then it has a second part, which also has a real part and an imaginary part. So that means at every point in space, there's something really hard to visualize. Because once you go to four numbers, that means if you want to make a version in your brain that has any kind of like spatialness to it, you need four dimensions. That's where I lose it too, <laughs> how to visualize four dimensions. The best we can do is draw it in some kind of weird schematic way, I guess. But we're missing some things when we do that. Okay, now here's the thing about the structure of the electron internally when you do this, when you do it this way. See, if you were to actually take this, now this waviness inside, it is not directly measurable. We need that much internal structure so that we can explain all of the complex ways the electron can interact. But we don't get to access the waviness directly. It's more like when two electrons come together and interact and do something crazy, it's only explainable if the electrons have this much mathematical structure within them. But really though, that's just something that's in our heads. I'm not saying that electrons are that. I'm saying that this is our mathematical way of representing what they are, and that's totally different than whatever their quote actual reality is, whatever they even mean. <laughs> but one of the mathematical features that this has is that if you were to take this and basically just rotate it, the way that that waviness internally looks when you rotate it like that is, well, actually kind of does this. Uh, the fancy name for this is doing a coordinate transformation. It's actually taking the object and rotating it to a different perspective. If it were a sphere, just a sphere, with no extra structure to it, you wouldn't even be able to tell that a sphere had been rotated. If it was totally featureless, you can't tell one orientation from another. The electron's not quite that, though. Because when you actually rotate the electron, even though it's not visible, 
mathematically, this just kind of shifts up the diagram or shifts down the diagram. You kind of imagine what it would have to look like if that was, it's obviously not a sine wave because its amplitude changes, but imagine if that whole waveform just kind of shifted up or shifted down. And that's what would happen if you rotated it. Again, we don't see it, but the mathematical structure has that feature. The thing, though, is that if you were to take the electron and then actually rotate it one full rotation, it would go back to this. It would be basically that peak sliding up to that peak. Or maybe it went the other way. Maybe the top peak slid down. So there's actually kind of two ways that this could shift internally. Now actually, mathematically, what that ends up resulting in is an electron's not one thing. It's actually two particles. And I'm not talking about electrons and anti-electrons. I am not talking about antimatter, just the plain old electron by itself. There's a name for this in physics. It's called chirality. Chirality, the word, has this kind of corkscrewing kind of notion to it. Uh, you come across it actually in some in chemistry too, particular organic chemistry. The human body actually interacts with the same protein, but if it's kind of chiral in that way versus chiral in the other way, the body will interact with it or not. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the electron by itself, though, but that's what chirality is. It is actually an internal property of excitations of fields. Now, the thing, though, is that we know the electron has mass, for sure. Right? It's not a massless particle. Now, mathematically, when a particle has mass, it actually takes these two chiralities, which are actually called right-handed and left-handed, which because it actually is, it actually is sort of a rotational thing going on inside the, inside the particle. But mathematically, when an object has mass, those two chiralities are blended together so that you're actually now just describing a single elementary particle that has both of those internal kind of twisting effects together simultaneously. So actually, if the electrons had zero mass, there'd be two of them, and we'd be able to tell the difference. Now, since you can't tell the difference, then we just say, okay, it's an electron, it's got two different of these chirality things, but it's all mix, mixed up because the electron has mass, and so that mixed up thing is the electron. Okay, doesn't mean the electron's actually like that, this is just a mathematical model, and, and actually the minimally complex mathematical model that we need to actually explain the behavior that we can directly see, yeah. Is like the superposition of those two chiralities always kind of in the same proportion, or? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Except when they're not. <laughs> <laughs> and this is directly related to the Higgs boson. Because oh, okay. <laughs> one of the things that we learned when we did this is that the weak interaction is a little weird in that, you might remember this, we talked about the weak interaction as the way that neutrons can turn into protons. We used it as a way to explain certain kinds of radioactive decay. We also learned that deep down, what it was about, deep down we learned that what it really was, was if you have a neutron, which is an up, down, down quark combination, if it were to turn into an up quark, which is an up, up, down combination, which happens, carbon-14 decay, a neutron in the carbon-14 turns into a proton, turning it into nitrogen, it is the way that we radioactively figure out the age of at least things that haven't been dead more than a couple tens of thousands of years. But it means that deep down what was happening was one of the two quarks was changing from one type into another. Uh, we even learned about this one in specific. Uh, the down quark has to turn into an up quark. If you took notes over the summer, you may have seen this. Uh, the down quark has a charge of minus a third. It sheds one unit of its negativeness in the form of a W minus boson, which makes it turn into an up quark, and then this very, 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 very quickly decays into an electron, and 
an electron antineutrino. This was the weak interaction. It's very subtle. It's extremely subtle. It's what allows certain kinds of radioactive decay. Now, the thing about this, though, and we didn't talk about this over the summer, the weak interaction is about as right-hand, left-hand biased as it could possibly be. Remember, these electrons, they have a mix of right-handed and left-handed chirality. The quarks do too, exactly the same setup. So that down quark right there, it is sort of 50% left-handed thing, 50% right-handed thing. Supposedly indistinguishable. The problem is that the weak interaction, which I really want to call, keep calling the weird interaction, only interacts with the left-handed side. That side. It literally doesn't talk to the right-handed neutron spin part of the electron at all. It only deals with the left-handed part. And what that means is that now the left-handed part and the right-handed part are not equivalent because there's an interaction in this universe that is maximally preferential. Now, that's the problem now, because as soon as you have that, mass is a contradiction. Because remember, the fact that the quarks and electrons have mass is what merged the left and right-handed parts together into a single entity. But now, you're not allowed to do that, because the weak interaction says, no, they're separate. But mass says, no, they're together. <laughs> so you have an internal inconsistency in the standard model, and when that happens, Something has to give. It means we don't fully understand something, but sometimes it's because something is missing. So maybe, because the weak interaction is fully left-handed, maybe what was really going on then was that those 12 objects at the top that make up the standard model ain't the whole deal. Now, the thing that all of these have in common, every one of them, is that they all have this notion of internal spin to them. You heard about this probably first in chemistry classes when you heard about the electron having like a spin up and a spin down, and that's how you can have two electrons in the 1s state or something like that. It's also the basis of the Pauli diffusion principle. Electrons can't all pile up in the same quantum state. They want to be as far apart as they can. And I don't mean because they're negatively charged. They do want to get far away from each other for that reason too. But press them together hard enough and because they have this internal spin, they cannot occupy the same region of space exactly. Okay, now where this goes from here though, is that if we're going to explain why particles have mass, it can't be because they have it themselves. It literally means that that electron doesn't have any mass of its own. It's gotta be from something else. And so that is what the idea of the Higgs boson is. The Higgs boson is a different kind of entity because unlike the other 12 things, which all have some degree of spin to them, the Higgs boson does not. It has no internal notion that it's got any kind of twisting going on. So it doesn't have this feature where if you rotate it, it's got this wave that goes up and down, either right-handed or left-handed, it doesn't have it. And what that means is that it is left-right-handed blind. And that means it's okay that it can have mass. Because if the weak interaction tries to interact with the Higgs, the Higgs says, you gotta either take me all at once or not at all, but not halfway. I don't have a left and right hand. It's just me. And so because of that, it's allowed to. Okay, so the idea then goes like this. Maybe the Higgs boson is the only particle actual rest mass, like E equals MC squared rest mass. Well, if that's true, then we must be talking about a moment that is wildly different from what we have today, because that is not today. <laughs> the idea then is, well, what if 
in the extremely early universe, just maybe a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, sometime extraordinarily early on, what if the universe was actually in a very different state altogether? Okay, that sounds awfully weird, but things going from one state to another shouldn't really bother you. I mean, after all, we've got liquids and gases and solids and plasmas and all kinds of things, right? These are different phases of matter. What if quantum fields did that too? What if quantum fields actually had phases? And under certain circumstances, they would change their fundamental structure based on essentially how hot or cold it was. Now, tons of evidence that the Big Bang happened, at least in some form or another, or at least the idea that the universe was very hot and very dense in the past when it was much, 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 much smaller. Okay, now, seriously though, how could temperature have anything to do with the structure of the vacuum? Though? That sounds weird, yeah. Uh, are, are quantum fields localized? Like, are these changes local, or are they the entire creation? Mm, okay, so that's a really important question. Uh, so for this one, the idea is that it is a non-local change. It does have to happen everywhere. Interestingly, though, we're not going to quite get into this, but interestingly, when this kind of a change happens in the quantum fields, it's a little bit like an ice crystal forming, where it starts in one place and then just kind of rapidly grows. Now, the quantum fields, when they do this, they grow at light speed. So they actually restructure the vacuum in an expanding bubble traveling at light speed. This is, by the way, not good. That means if this were to happen, now, we couldn't possibly see it coming, by definition. Now you might ask, but there's no danger of that, right? Uh. <laughs> Not to be depressing, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's the only one with mass, and okay, now, we, yes? Well, if that part would have to go, we'd have to go back even earlier than this to start talking about that. Like this would be like being able to treat quarks and electrons and photons as all some kind of different version of a more fundamental thing. Is that what you mean? Maybe. Uh, string theory would say yes. Um, tremendously work in progress. Uh, and also no evidence to really tell if one person's idea about string theory is better than someone else's. Maybe. But this is not this, this would be after that. This would be after the particles in the standard model had some form of identity, but different than what we need. Like the electron was massless, and the top quark was massless, and all of them were massless, except for the Higgs boson. Uh, and then a specific change happened. Mm -hmm. So does that mean the Higgs boson doesn't follow high uncertainty principle? Uh, no, it does. That's actually, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle isn't really connected with any of these like, chiral properties. It, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is purely about anything that is described by a wave-like fashion at all. So That's actually all it really is. Mass, doesn't it mean it's consistent? Uh, if, if it's consistent with? Like if, if other particles are actually a range of energies. And oh yeah, oh no, no, I told, yes, yes, I completely understand what you mean. Uh, no, no, the answer is absolutely, this has an uncertainty in it. The Higgs boson has a very short lifespan. So I'll actually show you a graph in a little bit of what the signal actually of the Higgs boson looks. And it's very broad. And it's because it lasts for such a short period of time, that means the uncertainty in the energy of that state is gigantic. And so no, well, while we say that it's got a mass, that's just its central value. But it has this giant spread around it. Oh, but because yeah. it's so short, they're all over. Um, yeah, well, actually, the fact that the, the fact that its lifetime is short makes it so that the mass has a large inherent, or the energy has a large inherent spread in it, and therefore its mass will have a large inherent spread in it too. Yeah, it's like literally, you're right. It's not a number, and we shouldn't be saying it that way. It should be this value plus the spread, and the spread's big because its life lifetime is so short. Yeah, great question. All right, so. But we're not talking about the phase, we're not talking about matter phase changing. We're talking about a field phase changing. But there are examples of that too. All right, let's, uh, let's take a piece of iron. It's a magnet. It's gonna be a magnet made to be a sphere though. If you think that's weird, Earth. <laughs> okay, we don't normally make magnets into spheres, but nothing stops you from taking a spherical hunk of iron and making a magnet out of it. It's not the most convenient, uh, but we'll just, just so the picture is a little bit similar. Now, if it's a magnet, then that, what, means, what it means is that the iron atoms inside kind of have a preferential direction, actually. And I could add a bunch of arrows to that to indicate them. This is 
it would be the magnetic field, but really the way that you want to think about this is this is describing the arrangement of the iron atoms inside. And that would be the magnetic field, I guess, that each of the little iron atoms produce. Now, if it's a permanent magnet, then there's some order to that, right? There's a preferred direction in that. But if you take this piece of iron that's a permanent magnet and you start heating it up, iron's got a melting point of about 1,500 degrees Celsius. Uh, but there's a temperature lower than that. It's around 1,050 Kelvin. It's called iron's Curie temperature. And above that temperature, it's still a solid, but you can't make it into a magnet. You literally can't. And if you try, it just goes back to being disordered. So in other words, above that temperature, you have something that looks random. But that's actually, if you think about it, kind of a phase change for a field where the field is kind of the localized internal magnetic field produced by each of the atoms. And it underwent a phase change when things got hot. Actually, more specifically, the preferred direction went away. And if you remagnetize this, actually, it could end up being in just about any preferred direction. It would depend on maybe you have an external field to choose one. But if you don't choose, then it will randomly line up. Now, the reason why the magnet does that is that all systems try to reduce any kind of potential energy they have, right? That falls because it will have less potential ener energy with Earth if it's on the floor versus up here. That is a statement that holds very strongly throughout physics. It is connected with entropy increasing also. Uh, so it means that this magnet will transition to whatever state has the lowest energy. But what that state is could vary, could depend very strongly on temperature. Okay, so in this case, above about 10,050 Kelvin, that's the lowest energy state. Below 10,050 Kelvin, it's the lined up state. But the idea that physicists had was that the vacuum does this too. If you make it hot enough, the vacuum will undergo a phase change. And what that means in this context is that the quantum fields will rearrange, possibly mix with one another. OK. So idea is that That's a really high temperature. Uh, as for why that, that's technical details. You kind of have to figure out, well, let's just say I don't know what the temperature is. We'll use experimental evidence from particle physics experiments to decide what that temperature would have to be in order for this idea to work. And the idea then is that when the universe was hotter than this, all the particles were completely massless, except for the Higgs boson. And then what happened was that as the universe cooled, a rearrangement happened. Now, the, the Higgs boson, uh, we kind of talk about it like it's one thing. But just like the electron is described by four numbers, two real and two imaginary, same thing with the Higgs. It's actually got four parts. And just like the electron, two complex parts, which means two real, two imaginary. But it's a bit unconventional. Two are charged, and two aren't. So I guess what we could do is we'll just call them H1, H2, H3, and H0. And we'll say that these are the charged ones, plus and minus, and H0 and H1 aren't. Now, here's the idea then. When we 
we learned about the weak interaction, one of the things we learned is that that is a very, 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 very heavy object. It's about one and a half, it's about one and a half times the mass of an entire iron atom. So it's kind of absurd to think of it as an elementary object uh, because it's such high mass. Uh, but then it lasts for 10 to the minus 25 seconds and then it's gone. Uh, so it's actually, a, it's a fluctuation that has really high energy that lasts just a short period of time. Now, the idea is, is that back at the beginning, the idea then is that those four parts, that's the photon on the left, and those are the three particles that have to do with how the weak interaction works on the right. And this diagram on the page after, that was the W minus. Four. Four parts. <laughs> the idea is that when this phase change happened, the four quantum fields that make up the Higgs particles and the four quantum fields that are the photon, the W plus, the W minus, and the Z zero, they mixed together. And it's already actually looking kind of good because if that's positively charged, the W plus is positively charged. If that's negatively charged, that the W minus is negatively charged. H zero and H one, they're both neutral. Photons neutral. Z zero is also neutral. So the idea is that when the phase change happened, the Higgs field had a phase change occurred, which just like the cooling magnet, remember, it was oriented randomly. Then it cooled off and it picked a direction. The equivalent to that here is that all four components of the Higgs, H1, 2, 3, and 4, they all had values zero. The quietest form of those quantum fields in the early universe was just zero. That's normal, right? Like the lowest amount of activity you can have in a field, you ought to call that zero, that makes sense. The thing is, is after the phase change, these three picked a direction, abstractly, which meant those three now had a value. And they merged with those four quantum fields. Actually, originally, these were actually called B, W1, W2, and W3. Because prior to this phase change, the fields that we have today, they were not the ones that were there before. The photon was something different. It was a mix of other things. The W plus, it was something else. Originally we had four, afterwards we have four, but the four that we have now are combinations of what the other ones, of what the original ones were. So the thing that we call H0, it combined with that B thing to become the photon. Now the H0, this was the one part of the Higgs that didn't pick up a value in that phase change. So that means H0 still is quiet, zero value, and they made it so the photon stayed massless. Now these other ones, When they say that the Higgs boson is what gives the other particles their mass, this isn't really accurate. What it really is is that the thing that we call electron today is a mix of what the electron field primordially was when the universe was hotter than a trillion Kelvin and one component of the original Higgs field. So when we say that we have an electron, what we really mean is kind of a 
combined excitation of two older fields that haven't been around separately for a long, long time. And those excitations are a simultaneous excitation of those. Mm. Now, actually, I did say that the photon is massless. But actually, the photon is massless, but there were two fields to start with. The photon is a very, very simple object. There's sort of more over here, complexity-wise, than would be over here if it was just a photon. So there actually are two quantum fields on the right. That one that I have as plus Higgs boson, really, I should have called this today's Higgs field. And that's actually what physicists went looking for. Because if any of this is going to make any sense at all, then it makes one very strong prediction. Now, never mind what was going on right after the Big Bang. The one leftover thing is that after these fields merged and reconfigured, there is a leftover one that's new. And if you want to establish the existence of this, then you have to create excitations of it. That's what the Higgs boson actually is. It's the excitations of this field, which needs to be here today, because we had all four of them present before, and we needed all four of them to mix properly to predict the particles that we see today. And so that was what the big deal was. Even in 1964, physicists had this ready to go. And so it took 50 years and a lot of hard work to build the technology that would allow us to locate the excitations of the Higgs field. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of what the excitation of the Higgs field kind of ends up looking like, not visually, but at least as a Feynman diagram. Oh dear. It goes like this. <laughs> so let's say that you were to create a Higgs boson. Now, the only way to do this is you have to slam particles together so hard that right in that collision zone, the average energy density of that little collision zone, which is connected with temperature, has to recreate the conditions a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. That's hard, but we've done it. It's what the, it was one of the, one of the main things the Large Hadron Collider were actually, was actually designed to do. But when you produce one of these excitations, the Higgs boson just decays almost instantly. So the H dotted line, that's meant to be the Higgs boson in these diagrams. The rest of the stuff that you see is kind of stuff that you know. This first diagram, A, says that, well, the Higgs boson, it decays right away. But when it does that, it's got to decay into matter and <laughs> antimatter in equal parts. That's the W plus, that's the W minus. Uh, you might ask, what the heck is just the W without a sign? Uh, actually, it could be the W plus going up or the W minus going down. It could be either. Uh, so just, just pick. It's actually both. Uh, but then, what this also means then, is that this W plus then goes this way, emits a photon. It can, because it's electrically charged, but if it does that, it has to recoil. Goes up, hits the W minus, that's its antiparticle, boom, that annihilation happens, and you get another photon. In other words, if the Higgs was there, you should see two photons in a particular arrangement of trajectories and energies. Hmm. Oh, but that's not the only way. <laughs> There's two more ways that you can start with the Higgs. You could, let's create a top quark and an anti-top quark and then the same sort of thing happens. Or let's make a W minus that kind of runs around in a loop but because it's charged can shoot off photons while it's doing that. This is very annoying as an experimenter because you start with the Higgs, you end up with two photons in all three cases. So how do you <laughs> tell them apart? The answer is, don't care because we don't care what happens in between. We're just looking to establish that the thing on the left even exists. So this is what particle physicists do. They take, in the case of the Large Hadron Collider, they take protons and more protons, and they shoot them together as hard as they possibly can. And what you do is you create a graph. Now, whenever I see it, for a long time, for years, when I was an undergrad going to 
talks on particle physics, I would see these graphs and my eyes would glaze over. <laughs> what the heck? Okay, I'm going to try to break it down. All right. M gamma gamma in GEV. Uh, this is weird. I thought photons don't have mass. So what's this? Uh, okay, what this really is, no, they don't have mass, but they have energy. And if you, so 140 GeV in energy means the two photons that came out of this. Whoops. The two <laughs> photons that came out of this, whoops, <laughs> were these two. And they were simultaneously measured. Their energy was recorded by the detectors added up the energy of those two outgoing photons. And what this graph is vertically is the number of times you measured that particular energy. So at 140 giga electron volts, the graph has a certain height, and that height is how often you measured the combined two photons to have that total energy. Now, when you take two protons and you slam two protons together, there's, about a, there's an incredibly large number of things that can happen, and the vast majority of them nothing to do with Higgs boson. What this curving line is, don't forget the bump for a second, the curving line is all of the other possible things that could happen when you take two protons and slam them together at high energies. So that's what's called background. But to physicists, what that means is all the other stuff that I don't care about. That's what they mean by background. And it's computed using the standard model but then what they look for is differences between that slope and, well, differences from that slope. In other words, the curve is what they got if you include all interactions that we currently knew of, minus anything involving Higgs boson. Then you go and measure it, and you see this weird thing at about 125 GeV, this bump that is definitely different. Now, remember what that means. What that means is that when the two outgoing photons have a combined energy of 125, they had to come from someplace. That 125 GeV of energy that those photons came from had to come from somewhere. And at 125 GeV, that's happening more often than we think it ought to, which means there's some new way that we were unaware of that would let us produce photons that have an energy of total 120 MeV. But to get these, it came from that. It literally just came straight from the decay of the Higgs boson. So we found it. Now, as for how hard this is, this is how hard this is. Take an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Don't fill it with water, fill it with sand. <laughs> Mixed in with that sand are three grains that are colored green. Go find them. <laughs> That is how, it, like, needle in a haystack does not even do this justice at all. It is way, way, way harder than that. And this is why it took so much, not just detector technology, we had to build entirely new computing networks just to be able to handle the amount of data that comes from this crazy device. Particle physicists literally built the technology for the internet originally so that they could share data worldwide. This had to take it up to an entirely new level uh, so that people around the globe, because no one, no one country pays $10 billion for any project like this. So it was this massive international consortium, and they had to build the framework that would let scientists all around the world access the data from the detector. Yeah? How complex would you be that the difference between the detected and the actual was only two digits? Yeah, so it's a good point. So that's what these little colored bands are. That's always the question is, could, maybe that's a statistical fluctuation. I mean, after all, there's some little bumps elsewhere. What about those? So physicists have a very, very, very strict criterion for this. It's called the five sigma rule. And what this basically is, this has to do with standard deviation. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Standard deviation? OK, right. So you have an average, and you'd like to know how frequently you can be one sigma away from the average. And it ends up being like 66% of the time you're within this far. 90% uh, of the time you're within this. Three sigma, which is like 99%, is this. Physicists aren't settled for that. They want to know that there is a 99.99999% chance that this is not random fluctuations. If you want to do that, if you, would have, you want to figure out this, you would then have to have, you would have to do this experiment 10 million times to actually get one of these by random chance. So it's a very, very, very stringent rule. 
Uh, so the green bar is this two sigma. If the bump were within the green, that would only happen 1% of the time. So it is way, 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 way outside of that range. Um, and if you're asking, yeah, but some others are too. <laughs> I'm actually not an experimental particle physicist. <laughs> that one's significant and all the other ones are not. <laughs> Sometimes physicists make graphs to just look good and display the thing that they absolutely know they have confirmed, but sometimes there might be some other glitches. So those other ones maybe, that what those other glitches could be is sometimes it's things in the detector that maybe the detector doesn't work perfectly, perfectly well, but they know the way that it doesn't work perfectly well, so they can kind of rule out that that's physics. Yeah. Uh -huh. Why does it only happen in the GEV? Okay, so the reason why it's happening at that GEV is that the it's not talking about the energy of the colliding particles. What it's talking about is the energy of the two photons that got produced. And if you look at the Feynman diagram, those two photons got produced by the decay of the Higgs boson. So everything in the photons came from that one place. What I mean is, yeah. why is it only there? Okay. Uh, mm. Not why is it there, why is it only there? Oh, 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 okay. So the graph, so minus, so the, the dashed line that you see on the graph, yes. that is all of the interactions that would produce a response at 125 GeV minus the Higgs. So it's kind of like saying, I'm going to see if there's anything there by very deeply understanding the entire standard model and use it to predict what this graph ought to look like, assuming that there's no such thing. As the Higgs boson. Well, then okay. why isn't the red line slightly above it all the way around? Oh, 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 okay. The reason for that, okay, yeah, yeah, good point, good point. Uh, so the, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the energy of the outgoing photons, so like these are the interactions that are not included in the red dashed line. So these interactions are extra. And where the bump is coming from is that. If the Higgs boson has a particular energy with uncertainty in it, then anything that it decays into, now these photons, remember they don't decay, they just keep going and going and going and going, they last a long time. So those photons have a very specific sum of energies. And it's not exact, but the uncertainty is very tiny. Yeah, well, right? yeah. So any of the spread that you see there, it's coming from the energy of the original Higgs boson actually oh. not being precisely defined. And the only reason you can see it at 125 is because? That's what the center of the distribution of the Higgs boson's energy is. Oh. OK. It's the question I asked you earlier. OK. OK, yes, this is the question you asked me earlier. Yes, it's directly related to that. OK. Now, but still, though, we kind of have to then understand still Fine, you predicted it, you found it. Really though, how does this actually explain then that ordinary particles, everyday electrons and quarks that we're made of, why does this translate into them having mass? Because I don't see any up quarks, down quarks, or electrons in any of those Feynman diagrams, so what is going on? See, here's the thing, is that we normally think of particles interacting with others, with other particles. In other words, this electron interacts with this electron because this vibration of the electron field over here sends virtual photons back and forth with this vibration of the electron field over here. And actually, anytime two things interact, there's a potential energy associated with it, right? Lifting something up off the ground, that object now has more gravitational potential energy with Earth than it did when it was on the floor. So potential energies are a way of thinking about interactions, broadly speaking. And not only that, it literally means that if I lift something up off the ground, the mass of that thing plus the mass of Earth is a little bigger than it is now. Because there's positive gravitational potential energy when it's lifted, and now there's less. So the Earth plus thing actually will be a little bit lighter when they're close, and a little bit heavier when they're further away. Now, 
The reason why this ends up resulting in all the particles, at least most of them, having mass, is that when this phase change happened in the early universe that we talked about, oops, when that happened, I mentioned that the H1, H2, and H3 parts of the Higgs field, those are the ones that gained a direction, in quotes. In other words, they gained a value. Value, H3 has a value, and those are mixed in with these old school versions of the W's and Z's. So in this room, we have a Higgs field with a non zero value, but it's quiet. It's still very quiet. Remember, particles are excitations of fields. So just having a Higgs field with a value of 10,000 everywhere in this room still means we don't notice any Higgs bosons. So unless you get it vibrating. That's hard. That's what we need that massive particle accelerator to do. Mm. But when you do this phase change and you merge the Higgs fields with the old massless versions, you get massive versions, but it's not because those particles actually have mass. It is not actually the case that the electron has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. What that actually is is the potential energy of interaction that the electron has with the non-zero Higgs field. The electron still has no, honestly, rest mass. Not really. But what it always has is a persistent, always-on interaction with the Higgs field. It's not a drag effect. It's not like the electron's just gonna stop because the Higgs field holds it back. It doesn't have that. It's smooth. It's a completely smooth Higgs field. So it doesn't act like a drag or something that's pulling on it, but it does have a constant potential energy. It's very much like if I were to take an object off the floor and then do this, there's no gravitational drag involved in that. Even though there is this extra energy associated with that separation, which counts towards that object's mass with Earth, but if I'm just moving it sideways, that doesn't change, and there's no gravitational drag, at least not to the left, that would make this slow down. It's like that. So we live in a universe that is kind of messy, because the universe cooled off, and that caused the Higgs fields to go back to the Higgs fields to pick up directions that mix together with the original quantum fields, the ones we have today, have mass because of their continual interactions, not with Higgs bosons, but with the Higgs field itself. Yeah. So you mentioned the lifting example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if I'm lifting something, yeah. mm -hmm. is it have, it, does it have more mass because it's interacting with the field that interacts with the Higgs boson field? Um, it's more that, well, the, so the lifting example, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, that energy, that's a gravitational potential energy, and so it's not covered by the standard model in oh, any part the of the physics way. Oh, it's not the mass itself, it's, okay. yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's like the, okay. Yeah, like if there were like a quantum version of gravitational interactions, there would be a way to talk about that. We just have no idea how to do that, right. to be honest. So one final thing is the universe underwent a phase change. <laughs> do we have to worry about that ever happening again? Now. Okay. When particle physicists over the last couple of decades made careful predictions about what the Higgs boson's mass ought to be, we had some ideas, but it, it had a lot of uncertainty in it. In other words, we didn't know quite what this graph was exactly going to look like. There was a range of values where the Higgs boson could have an energy from about 125 up to, could even have been around 200. In other words, this graph keeps going. And it could have been anywhere between 125 and about here. The fact that it ended up on an extremely, on the extreme low energy end of this, well, actually puts it in an uncomfortable arrangement. Because when the Higgs field's value is that low, it's actually un, a bit unstable to additional phase changes like that. And there is literally no way to know when or if that's going to happen. We do not know enough about the underlying physics to predict that. If the Higgs boson had been like twice as heavy as this, we would be able to say, nope, 
we're safe. The Higgs field will never reconfigure like that again. But it's borderline still possible. <laughs> yes, go ahead. It only seems that you're saying that, oh, there's a difference in energy here. The only thing we could possibly attribute that to is the Higgs field. But like, how are you actually sure that that's the Higgs field and not something else? Because awesome. then you open questions of like, well, could there be a phase change? Yeah, okay, so this is, all right, so it's always a valid question. If you see something, how do you know that it is what you think it is? Right, no, no, that, and you're, it's totally fair too because there are, so as soon as this got seen, people started saying, is it the Higgs boson? Well, and they'll be very cagey with their response. They'll say, it is consistent with the simplest version of the standard model, Higgs boson. You're like, okay, you're covering yourself. <laughs> um, but what that really is, is the Large Hadron Collider was not designed to make precise measurements of the behavior of the Higgs boson. It was hard enough just to make it in the first place. And we knew that it would be monstrously hard to detect anyway. So this was the only goal. Right now there's projects on the drawing board to make different kinds of accelerators whose sole purpose in life will be to not discover the Higgs boson, but to measure its properties very precisely. Now that we know exactly what its energy is, we can actually decide what to build. And those can be high precision machines. And you're completely right in saying, we don't know that that's what this is. And there are plenty of other things that physicists would like to have found. They would have li liked to have found something that's connected with what the dark matter is. We still don't know that. Actually, there are some cases where this is consistent with sort of an expanded version of the Higgs field that's some where some of the components of it can be the dark matter candidate. But we don't know because this was too much of a blunt instrument. Despite its complexity, as far as going after the properties of it, it was still kind of a blunt instrument for that. So stay tuned, the Large Hadron Collider is currently undergoing upgrades that will make it so that it can produce many, 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 many more Higgs bosons, and then that will let us start to look at its properties rather than just it being there. Yeah, so we're, we're working on it, yes? What would happen if uh, fields changed? You, we wouldn't be able to know it before it happened. The problem is that when the when the fields when the vacuum reconfigures like that, it expands at light speed. So in other words, once it gets here, it's already too late, and we can't know before because the signal of it doesn't actually propagate ahead of it. Yeah, uh, people actually though look for signatures of this, not in our part of the universe, but this is actually not even the only phase change that happened in the early early universe. There was another one called inflation, which does not have to do with this, but it is why the universe is so, how do I put it, even. Now we don't normally think of it as like, what, there's an Earth here, but there's no Earth over there. What are you talking <laughs> about even? That makes no sense whatsoever. But on the other hand, if you get outside of the solar system and outside of the galaxy and outside of the local group, outside of the local super cluster of galaxies, zoom out so far that you can't even see galaxies anymore, from that point of view, the universe actually is quite evenly spread out. It's almost like, the clusters of galaxies, entire groups of like hundreds of galaxies, are behaving like individual particles in a gas, like in this room. Wow. You zoom out that far. Now, what that means then is that the universe has this uniformity. Who knows? How do you explain why that patch of the universe over there, which let's say is 14 billion years away, light years away, and the room of that patch over there that's 14 billion light years away in the other direction, there would literally have been no way for any signals from that distant galaxy over there to even reach that distant galaxy over there since the Big Bang. So if they have no way of communicating, how could they possibly coordinate in any way so that the different parts of the universe could somehow be similar? Unless there was something that happened that took parts of the universe and exponentially expanded them incredibly rapidly and then shut off and the universe coasted in its expansion after that. We have an incredible amount of evidence that that thing that I just described called inflation, called inflation happened. It leaves a very specific signature on the light coming from the most distant parts of the, distant parts of the universe called the cosmic microwave background. So we're really certain on that one. We don't know why or what triggered it. The phase change could be something like that, actually, where if it were to happen, it would cause this massive rapid expansion. Uh, we would not get pushed aside. Actually, the quantum fields would rearrange, and then like none of the stuff that we're made of even exists under the new conditions. <laughs> yeah. So it would just disappear. Cool. It would just, yeah, <laughs> just be done, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of piggybacking off that, um, does the direction of the field matter? Like, is that what makes it so that what we are made of is 
Ah, uh, no, change, like, a really good point. Something else. Yeah, okay, so no, it actually doesn't matter. And the interesting thing about that is that the fact that when the Higgs field did that, the fact that the direction doesn't matter is actually what let the photon stay massless. Actually, it's related to that. Yeah, so no, it could have been something else, but no, it's actually the, this is called, this is called, the fancy name for all this is called electroweak symmetry breaking. Symmetry breaking is there was something that didn't have a direction before and now it does. That's symmetry breaking. It's picking a particular direction when there was no reason to choose. Uh, so the Higgs field did that too. And when you have a piece of it where something wasn't picked out, that actually corresponds to a massless particle. Question. Yep. So if I subtracted the red line, like a particular point from the dotted line, uh -huh. would that be the median of the range of energies in a Higgs boson? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you could do that with this graph actually. Is it like something... a bell curve? Uh, is it exact? Mm. Because like, why else would you just see it there? I believe the answer is yes, okay. and it's because that the uncertainty principle leads to a completely random fluctuation in the energy. And so it's not biased in any way, shape, or form. So it's like independent measurements, kind of like throwing dice, like one dice roll does not affect the next right, one. So it would be. Yeah, it, I believe so, it's a bell curve. Yeah. Like a normal distribution? Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 <laughs> yep. Yeah, not like the shape of a bell, it's called that because it has that kind of a shape, but yeah, normal distribution, yeah. <laughs> that's, what the boson, that's what the Higgs boson is. And it's also why we care, because we would like to know why, we, why the heck we are here. <laughs> and fundamentally, if the Higgs mechanism didn't exist, and that Higgs field didn't do what it did, a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, there are no particles with mass, and everything just shoots around the universe at light speed with no chance whatsoever to bind up and form atoms and form us so we can ask these kinds of questions. That's it. We're wrapped. We answered the question. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank you.